Okay, <clears throat> now, very quickly, a couple of things. Number one, remember, think general, not specific, okay? Now, for instance, it says when we command the sickness to be healed, it makes the unclean spirit to leave the sick person. Yes, if that's what you believe, right? Now, if you believe you have to be specific, guess what? That's the law you've made, and you will have to live by that. I'm telling you, it's exhausting, right? So don't, don't do that. <laughs> live, t- make your believing general, then you can command general, and it will work. See, here's the thing. Here's what you have to remember. Remember what I told you about Dr. Summerall about how he said, you know, if it's good for, one, for it to be good for anybody, it has to be good for everybody. Remember that? It's a good rule. Remember this. Now, if... <clears throat> you, you have to remember, this is all I do, right? This is all I think about, literally. I'm, I'm telling you, I'm not... Um, <clears throat> I, I, I annoy people, you know, especially my family. I mean, seriously, because this is what I talk about. Now, I, I am blessed because we sit around our table, you know, for supper, and, you know, it's, you know, past the meat, past the mashed potatoes. At least that's what I'm saying. They're, <coughs> they're saying other stuff. But, but, and it's like, oh, did you hear about the dead raising that happened in California yesterday? One of our people raised it. I'm like, awesome, that's cool. Hand me the mashed potatoes. You know, and just like, we get that. I mean, and we talk about healings. We talk about, sin. I mean, it's amazing, right? I, I am blessed. And, but at the same time, I'm, I am extremely narrow-minded, <laughs> okay? But, but I choose to be. Now, what I mean by narrow-minded is I'm, I'm narrow in what I think about. I'm disciplined in what I think about. I don't think about everything under the sun. I don't think about junk, all right? What, I, what I'm thinking about is I'm always analyzing. I'm analyzing what I'm teaching. I'm analyzing what I'm hearing. I'm analyzing what I'm writing down, all that stuff. And I'm always looking at it and saying, okay, can this be said better? Can it be done this way? I'm always analyzing. One of the things in the analyzation is that I have found, for instance, for it to be right for anybody, it has to be right for everybody. So if, for example, the teaching that is in the the church currently concerning to get healed, you have to go back in and break the generational curse or break this thing. Right? Now, if that's true, that means that nobody could get healed any other way. You understand? Because for it to be right, it has to be right all the time. For it to be a law, for it to be a rule of God, if it's right, if God's... And, and if you don't have to do it every time, then you don't have to do it any time. You understand? Now, the difference, and I'll give you the specifics on this in just a minute. It is in your manual, so you can find it. It's basically one of the last chapters of the manual. But... I'll just give you an example. See, many times we live, when I lived at, um, I, I lived in a little North Texas town, went to an Assembly of God church. It was an amazing church, awesome worship, good pastor. I, it was just, it was good. And everybody in that whole area knew this church because it was the church to go to because that's where everything was happening spiritually. Unfortunately, the people that live in that area most of them, it's a little bitty, small town, and they never go anywhere else. So the entire spectrum of, of Christianity, they thought was in that church. And they thought that what that church was doing was everything God was doing. I, I know that sounds strange, but I hope you understand what I mean by that. In other words, it's like, wow, this is awesome. But they never got out. They never saw anything else going on anywhere else. And when you get out into the big world, you realize what you thought was so great might not be the greatest thing out there. You understand? And so it was, it was awesome and, uh, you know, good people and all that kind of stuff. Nothing wrong with that. But here's the thing. Many times in healing, for instance, is you as an individual. Maybe you're praying for people. Maybe you're not yet. Okay? Maybe if you are, maybe you're praying, when you say you're praying for people, see, if I say I'm praying for people, I mean I have probably prayed for 100 to 200 people that week. You know, at least, at least, all right? I'm talking about, I'm not talking about in a meeting like this. I'm talking about just being at home, not in meeting, all right? In a meeting like this, I might pray for 500 people. You know, or what I mean by that is I pray for 500 things. In other words, people, a lot of people come to me one time, then they come up again for something else. And so I may, I may pray 500 times, okay? You understand? For everybody's problems. Now, when you say that you pray for people, you may pray f- you know, you say, well, I, I'm praying for people. That may mean you prayed for 10 people in a month. Now, do you see the difference, right? Now, because of that, your viewpoint 
is different than mine. See, when I think of, of for, for me, when I think of ministering healing, I have to think of ways, you know, I have to look at it from a point of view of, okay, how can I get more people healed at a time? How can we get this spread? How can we get more people free? It's not about how can I get bigger meetings. I, that's not what I'm, I never, I never think of that. I, you can ask anybody that I've been around while I'm here. I've not asked anything about the meetings, number of people, anything. Because that, that's not my business. God, that's God's business, right? I just, wherever I go, I preach, I do what I do there, and the rest is up to God. And so, but <clears throat> I do meetings with small groups, and I'll meet in, a peop- in people's houses, and I've preached in houses, and I've preached in stadiums. So it doesn't matter for me either way. But when you get there, it is different, right? I mean, it's different between sitting across the table with five people sitting around the table and preaching to a crowd this size or even, you know, a stadium filled people or going to India and preaching in an open field meeting, you know, where you might have 50,000 people. We, we've had people write me right now from India that said, if you can come over here, and as long as you stay, I, we can take you to different places each night, and I can guarantee you will have crowds of 50,000 people each night as long as you stay. Right. Amen? And, well, obviously you say, well, that'd be awesome because that's more people we're reaching. Now, here's the thing. If, the, if for someone to get healed, and, and it's, it's really funny when you think about this, but if you believe because of your maybe your limited viewpoint, or I'm not being mean, I'm not trying to demean anything, all right? I'm, I'm just saying, if you've only been involved in people around your area and you only pray for a handful of people, then you can have a certain perspective about healing. See, you may have the time to take each one of these people and sit down with them and go into their life and go through their history and find out every detail of their grandfather and their grandmother and this person did this and you may be able to go through and take the time to break this thing and break that thing and all that kind of stuff, right? Maybe you have that kind of time. I don't, right? I'm gonna be standing on a field in India with 50,000 people. So do you understand what I'm getting at? In other words, for it to be right for anybody, it has to be right for everybody. In other words, if you have to do that to get somebody free, then I should have to do that to get somebody free. And if I do that, then you cannot have mass meetings. You have to go back to a counseling type thing where I meet with you individually in a room and we sit there and go through your history, which is not found in the Bible. Do you understand? Now, but I can stand on a field and speak words, which you would call a prayer basically, but just speak a command that everybody in that field be healed and set free. And out of 50,000, there's probably going to be at least about uh, 38, 30, probably about 42,000 people that need healing, right? Because in every crowd, usually at least 90% of the people there need healing without fail, right? Usually, and that's in the church. I mean, that's, <clears throat> that's not even the world, okay? And the world is even greater than that. Actually, it's pretty close to the same technically, which it shouldn't be, but it is. But anyway, <clears throat> so... If I can stand on a platform and say that and people get healed, then that totally denies the idea that you have to go into anybody's background, right? Now, you say, well, so you don't think anybody would have to, okay, it's the difference. Paul said, forgetting the things that are behind, I press on, right? And he said, I came to you not knowing anything among you. I purposed. In other words, I made a point to know nothing among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. So in other words, he said, I'm not looking at your problem. I'm here to present you with the answer, right? Usually all this stuff, now I'm not against counseling. Well, what you, well let, me, let me get it right. <clears throat> what you call counseling should be included in discipleship, okay? And, but it's not a sit down and I don't know you and you're going to come in like a professional. I'm going to give you my business card and you're going to come in. We're going to sit down and talk. Oh, you got 45 minutes. Oh, your time's up. Ding. Okay, go ahead. And that's not discipleship right? That's a business, and it is a secular business. It is not biblical, all right? Simple as that. Now, I'm not saying you can't help people and you don't do some good. Okay, you can, but I'm just saying don't call it biblical if it's not biblical. If you can't find it in the Bible, it's not biblical, right? Now, you don't see, you know, the, the sixth, five-fold ministries, the sixth one, you don't see counselor there, <laughs> right? I mean, come on. I say, I'm just, I, I'm all for the power of God, I want God to be glorified, not somebody that has knowledge. 
And that, that's why, see, I, I could sit here and tell you what I know. And I mean, that's, you say, well, that's what we're here. We're at a seminar. But yeah, I hope you understand my being here, my point is not about knowledge. And it's not just to impart knowledge because knowledge will fail. Right? But if I can develop in you a heart for God and a heart for your fellow man, even when your knowledge fails, you'll push on just because you love people. And you'll get to the root of it even if you don't do it necessarily perfectly right, you'll still help people. So I'd much rather have somebody with heart than somebody with head. Amen? Does that make sense? So that's what we're trying to push for. Now, now there is information you need, and there's a few things that we need to tweak, and we're going to do that, so it's going to be good. But I'm just trying to get across to you that it's not whatever... Ha- if you think that those things have to be done, then it's got to be done for everybody. And if it doesn't have to be done for everybody, then it doesn't have to be done for anybody. Now, I'm not saying there aren't people that need to sit down and talk through some things. But I'm just saying, it is not where people put it into this thing and say, well, oh, you've got to break this, and you've got to break that, and you've got to set that. Now, the reason I'm saying that is because... Um, what was it? We had a question here about that, technically. Something along those lines, yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, what is your, well, this isn't it, but it, we'll get to there. What is your position on the role of intercessors for the kingdom and the church? They're good, right? But true intercessors, the problem is a lot of times they get too, they, they are called alongside the church to help the church, and they start giving their input to the leadership of the church, and then when the leadership doesn't take their input, they get mad, right? And then they, all of a sudden, they start getting visions and words about the leadership, so, okay. Now, so I, I'm all for that, but let's just keep it where it's supposed to be and where it's going toward, and they should be as a backup and a help. And when you hit something and you're trying to figure it out, that's where the intercessor should say, yeah, we've been coming up with this, and here's what, and it should help direct, all right? Intercessors should be operating in words of knowledge, words of wisdom, things like that. It should be operating along the way. If they're not, then it's not so much intercession as much as it is just, you know, somebody getting into something. Right, you know, into a, a, a role of some sort. So, um, let's see. <coughs> let's see. Yeah, good, good. Okay. Uh, okay, yeah. Okay, we're good there. Now, try and get some of these done real quick. I want you to go ahead and turn in your manual. We're actually. <laughs> 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 Look at that. Look at that. Uh, and that is just sad. You sound surprised. <laughs> 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 So we have to hit some of these things today because <laughs> we're going to go to chapter two. <laughs> we're just moving right along through this, aren't we? <laughs> so, no. uh, so you can be there. They're good. Okay, while you're turning to chapter two, which I think is on page six or something like that, it says, yesterday you were talking about dirt, which can cover the surface of soil, and we can't see the growth of the planted seed. What is the dirt? Usually the dirt is wrong believing, wrong words, uh, negative attitude, negative um, disposition toward what you're trying to get, right? You, okay, if I'm praying for you, or if you're praying for somebody, okay, they shouldn't be praying. You understand? When you're praying for, if I'm praying for you, please don't pray. And, and I'm not being mean, but come on, it, your prayers hadn't helped so far, so <laughs> stop, okay? I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to be... Well, I'm tell you, if your prayers hadn't helped at that point, that's why you're here is because they haven't worked. So when you get there, just don't pray. Just stop. Let me do it, right? Because you can't force water into a faucet that's on. Yeah. You understand? If it's pouring out, you can't force anything back up in it, the force of it pouring out. Well, when you're praying, hopefully, you are praying. You're probably praying somebody your soul, but you're also hopefully praying out of the Spirit also. So it's pouring out, so it's hard to put anything in you because whatever goes in comes right back out because you're turned on and speaking. And the words come out, that's the way it comes out. So the best thing to do is when, by that time, just come up, pray, and just receive. Just get into neutral. You don't, you don't even have to agree with me. Just get into neutral. And sometimes you think you're agreeing by praying, and in actuality, even though you're, 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 you're thinking you're agreeing, you're actually working against it because you're putting out, and I'm trying to put in, and you're, what I'm putting in, you're pushing back out. Okay? Because this is life. So just it, remember, you're, the spirit that's in you is the same spirit that's in me. And as I try to put life into you, it's that same spirit that goes in and comes right back out. So don't do that, right? Just go into neutral and receive. Amen? And whenever you're praying for people, don't let them pray. Just, just have them stop and just say, hang on. I want you to hear what I'm saying. And not that they have to, but at least it shuts them up. Okay? <laughs> <coughs> so 
I was in, I said, I got to get you away from this detail-oriented thing. I got it, yeah, I got it, because I'm telling you, if you get bogged down in details, the enemy will keep you bogged down the rest of your life. He will tie you up into something, and you will never be any real help to anybody, right? When I was in, um, the way I learned this was I was at a Russian church in America, and <clears throat> I had spoke, and I had an interpreter with me. They only spoke Russian. They did not speak English. Really, nobody there hardly did, maybe just some of the leadership. And I preached for a while, and the interpreter interpreted for me, and then when we got done, they said, uh, you know, would you pray for the sick? I said, yes, you know, tell them to come up. So everybody came up. And right when I started to go down to pray for the sick, my interpreter got called away because of something. So I head down. I'm thinking he's going to come. And he's not showing up. So I'm thinking, well, I can't stay here all night. These people didn't understand a word I was saying. I didn't understand a word they were saying. But I knew this. The spirit in me knows their problem. Right? So I don't have to know. But this is where I, where I figured this out. So I just went down the line. I held up my hands, and they're looking at me like what? And so I'd take their hands, I had to show them. I took their hands, and I just started praying. I said, in the name of Jesus, I set you free. Life, be healed, head to toe. It just various things like that. And then I would just turn around. I said, All right, God bless you. Went to the next person, boom, did the same thing. Boom, boom, boom. Prayed for well over 100 people. Went home that night. That was Saturday night. Sunday morning came back. When I came back, the first thing the pastor did was wanted testimonies from the healing service. I didn't know of any, you know, really. I, did, I mean, because I didn't see anybody with anything <clears throat> physical that, that could change, you know, that, that needed changing at that point. Basically, everything I saw or that, I, that they had apparently was internal. And so he started calling for testimonies. And hands started going up. And they all came down front, and he had the microphone, they said it, and <coughs> he just interpreted. And then... It was amazing because I started listening to all these testimonies. I mean, dramatic things. Tumors. Uh, one lady had blood in her eye that she couldn't see. I didn't even, I didn't even see it. I didn't even remember seeing her. And she, her eye was completely clear. I mean, it's amazing. Just the whole, I mean, there was probably a good 80 some odd people that came up for testimony. Just boom, 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 boom. And they were healed that night. Now, I didn't know anything that was wrong with any of them but they got healed. You know? Now that just totally blows away the idea that you have to know anything, break anything, do anything. I'm telling you, if we get the secret of this, the secret is very simple. It's just life. That's, that's it. <clears throat> it is this divine life that's in us that whatever it gets onto, it drives out sickness and disease. And the more details you have to know, the less power you're operating in, <clears throat> and even the, the more you're limiting. I mean, think about it. As we preach, we are preaching something that literally words can't do it justice. Right? I mean, who can, who can faithfully, truthfully, completely speak about God in any aspect and totally put it out perfectly in completion. Nobody. Every, again, Dr. Sumrall, he said, <clears throat> the Bible, God, everything in, this, in the Christian life is like a diamond with 52 facets. And you can look at it from each facet and see a different viewpoint. He said, because it's in there. He said, it, it's, you look at these different things. Well, God is so magnificent and the things that, that are in the Word of God are so magnificent that how could we ever say anything that came close to really doing it justice? But yet, look what gets done. You know, just because we have this treasure in earthen vessels that God, God decided to live in man. Well, if he decided, then he must know what he's doing. And so, if he's going to live in man, he can live through man. And our job is just to get out of the way, which usually the best way, getting out of the way isn't doing nothing, going, well, okay, I'm just going to let the Spirit move. That's not getting out of the way, right? There is no void in the Spirit. You try to void your mind, you'll get a demon. Simple as that. You're never told to void your mind. You're told to renew your mind, right? So as you renew your mind, that's you getting out of the way because you're renewing your mind to Him and He is living through your mind and can actually flow through you more. So that's what this, everything in the Christian life is about renewing the mind. Every bit of it. That's where the battle is. That's where everything goes on. Any struggle you have, it's in your carnal part of your mind that's left. Amen? Now, 
<clears throat> I want to say it because on, in chapter 2, it's an old covenant mindset versus a new covenant mindset. Now, <clears throat> the just real quick here, an old covenant mindset, how you can tell you have an old covenant mindset is that you will always think you don't have enough, that you need something else. An old covenant mindset is always saying, what's God doing? Let's go inquire the prophet. Let's go ask them. Let's go see what God is doing because you really don't believe you have a direct connection with God. Even though you'll tell people that. See, it's, it's amazing how <clears throat> we have this dichotomy in how we think. We have this, this division that we will say, oh, Christianity is union with God, it's relationship, it's the fatherhood of God, it's God wanting intimacy with you. And then you try and say, but we've got to go find the prophet so we can hear what God's saying. See, we, we, we talk, as we say in Texas, out of both sides of our mouth. You know, we just say things, and, and yet we don't even realize what we're saying. <clears throat> the old covenant always was, it was always over there. It was always future. It was always going to happen. It was always what God is going to, that's why all the Old Testament, there's so much prophecy. Why? Because it's all future. See, here's what you have to realize. <clears throat> I was reading scripture, and it said, Jesus said, of all the prophets born of women, there's not arisen one greater than John the Baptist. Jesus said that. And I, when I read that, I thought, okay, that's, that I, that I don't get that. John the Baptist did no miracles, no healings, nothing. How could he be the greatest prophet? I mean, you got Moses splitting the Red Sea. You got Elijah. You got Elisha. You got these guys that are calling down fire. You got miracles, I mean, come on, that's, how could he say that John the Baptist was the best prophet? And so, when I come into a situation like that, I just stop and ask God, how is that? Because, I, you know, I, I don't want to just gloss over it, but I couldn't believe it. So, what you have to do when you can't, when you read something you don't understand, you can't believe it like that, you have to decide to believe it, even though you don't understand it, and then you just ask God, and then he'll reveal it to you. But first, you have to decide to believe it, right? And so, I just, I say, okay, God, I know I know Jesus said this, so I know it's true. I don't understand it. Well, what is it talking? How can that be? And he said, well, what is a prophet? Well, he's somebody that speaks for God. He said, it's somebody that has a message from God. So being the best prophet doesn't mean he had the greatest miracles. It means he had the best message. And I thought, okay, so what, did, what message did John the Baptist have different from everybody else? If he was the greatest prophet, he had to have a different message. And then I remembered all the old prophets, every one of them said the same thing. Every one of them said the same thing. He's coming. He's coming. He's coming. John the Baptist was the first one that could look up and say, he's here. <clears throat> That's what made him the greatest prophet. Why? He had the greatest message. But then, I kept reading, in the next part of that verse, Jesus said, but of, of, he said, of all the prophets born of women, there's not a risen one greater than John the Baptist. How be it, or notwithstanding, he said, he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than John. Well, now that really messed me up. <laughs> yeah? I mean, I, I could believe John was the greatest prophet, but now he says the least in the kingdom. Okay, that, that could be me. And he said, I'm better than John. Well, I see, I couldn't get that. I'm like, I, just, I don't know. I don't know how you could do that. And I said, well, what, <clears throat> how, how could that be, God? And he said, well, John, all the other prophets were saying he's coming. John said he's here. But then John said, there goes the Lamb of God. He said, the least in the kingdom never has to say, there he goes. Why? Because he said, I live in you, I abide in you, I will never leave you nor forsake you. That's what makes us greater. See, that, John was greater than the prophets, and we're greater than John. Why? Because they were saying he's coming, John said he's here, John said, there he goes, and we say, he abides, he will never leave me. Amen? Amen. That's what makes us greater than any of the prophets, greater than anything else. And yet we want to run back to the prophets to find out how to live a new covenant life when they weren't even in the new covenant. See, the prophets and all these people are looking into the things that we're walking in because without us, they cannot be made perfect. They, Jesus said, Abraham longed to see my day. Wait, we got it. See, that's the thing. We got it better than the people in Jesus' day. Why? Because the best they could do, for the most part, was see things. He said, Jesus said very clearly that we are more blessed when we believe without seeing. Amen. See, what they did, they saw him there. They could touch him. They could see, wow, yeah, that guy's blind. Now he can see. This person was dead. Now they raised him. Wow, that's, Je that's Jesus right there. I want to follow him. 
But now you're following him and you haven't seen him do those things. You understand? I mean, I'm talking about the things that happened then. So you had greater faith to come in and believe on him than they did because you believed without seeing. Amen? So you're already a jump ahead of the people that actually walked with him. And yet we always go, oh, if I could just walk with Jesus, if I could just be back there. No, this is a greater time. You say, well, how could that be? Well, because we can do greater works. I've done greater works in Jesus. You know how? I was in America one day, and I got a call from Australia. And the lady was on the phone, and she said, would you pray for me? I said, yes, I prayed for her. Commanded healing. She, I said, now begin to move. I said, how's that? She said, I'm free. Jesus never set by somebody free from another continent. <laughs> right? Yeah, come on, that's a, that's a greater work. Now, it wasn't what you were expecting. <clears throat> But this is a great day to live. I told my wife not too long ago, I said, John Lake would have loved to live now with the technology we have and the things we have. This would, I mean, come. And the bad part is all the stuff they did with the lack of technology. And what are we doing with the technology? We should be so far outstripping what they did that it shouldn't even be funny. I mean, it ought to be just so, we ought to just be taking this world by storm. You know, and instead we got teaching. Well, you got to sit. You got to wait. You got to get the anointing. Well, you can't tie into a principality without a special word from God. My Bible says I got authority over all devils. That includes any principalities or anything else. Amen. You got to realize whenever you walk into a building, if you are the only Christian there, you are the highest spiritual being in the building. I don't care if it's full of devils. I don't care if it's principalities. There is nothing higher spiritually than you. Do you understand that? The, uh, let me say it this way if, to be totally accurate. The only person higher than you is God himself. I'm talking about God the Father. You say, what about Jesus? No, 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 no. You and he are equal. You're one. Do you understand? I know you don't believe that, but it's true. Okay? You know, cause it's, it's amazing. When you look at it, I'll prove it to you in just a few minutes. We're going to go there. Okay? <clears throat> I promise you we will get there. <laughs> so, even if I have to stay till next week. No, 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 all right, page six there, I think it is, in your manual, it shows old covenant mindset, new covenant mindset, the old covenant mindset is always looking out there for something, the new covenant mindset is you have what you need, Christ lives in you, if you have Christ, you have the kingdom, you have everything you need, you don't need any addition, right, you don't need anointings, you don't need all these impartations, that kind of thing, listen, I did this a long time ago. I don't have it here with me. Maybe you can find it on the internet or something. I don't know, but <clears throat> eventually we'll have it out. I did a three, actually it was two messages. Took three CDs, but it was two messages. <clears throat> the first one was called from Moving from Impartation to Incarnation. You need to quit thinking about getting an impartation and start realizing that you need to incarnate the living word. Right? So you need to move from someone putting hands on you to letting what's in you be seen outside of you. So you need to become the word incarnate, literally. So you need to quit moving, you need to move from imparting to incarnation, right? Impartation, incarnation. Then I took them another step after that and I said, now, you need to move from visitation to habitation. Nowhere in the New Testament does it really talk about visitation. And when it, the only time it does is it refers back to the time of the first outpouring of the, uh, talking about in Joel and it talks about that visitation. So it doesn't talk about, well, we need a visitation of God. No, you don't. You are the habitation of God through the, by the Spirit. You don't need a visitation. You need to become a habitation. God doesn't come to visit you. He came to live in you. You understand? Your problem is you think he comes and goes or that he meets you at church. You know, and then he, he comes upon you, and when he comes upon you, that's his visitation. No, he lives in you. The times when you think he's coming upon you, that's when you're for somehow getting bold enough to stretch and let him out of you. Right? Look, uh, we're going to talk about the anointing today because this, this is a big thing because I want you to realize it. <clears throat> Very simply, the anointing doesn't come and go. It abides. It doesn't increase. It doesn't decrease. Do you understand? It does not increase. It does not decrease. I will prove this from Scripture again. Now, the reason I say that is because the way you have to, to realize it is that the anointing is a person, the Holy Spirit. Now, if the Holy Spirit was standing here on the, on the platform, that was every bit of him. He was nowhere else. He wasn't in anybody. He was there. Could he increase or decrease? No. He is total power. Amen? He is what he is. He's not going to increase. He's not going to decrease. So when we talk about 
increase or decrease. Well, the anointing is going to increase. Then it's not him increasing or decreasing. Really, if you want to get down to it, it's very simple. For him to increase, we have to decrease. It's not him increasing. It's us decreasing and getting out of the way. You understand? In other words, it's kind of like the moon, you know, when you have a, a, a lunar, uh, what do you call it? Eclipse. Eclipse, that's it, yeah. When you have that, it, it, the moon doesn't get smaller, right? But it just gets hidden. Okay, the Holy Spirit in you, the anointing in you doesn't get smaller, doesn't get bigger. It just gets hidden more. And unfortunately, we're hiding it more. And so you've got to learn how not to hide it. So and when you do that, people say, oh, look, the anointing increased. No, you got out of the way. They could see it more. You understand? Now, it's like an onion. You take an onion. You can take an onion. You can smell it. It doesn't do anything, really, generally. You take that onion. You, you sit it on your table at home. Nothing happens. But you take that onion, and you start peeling the layers. And there's layer after layer after layer. And then, right, it goes all the way down. the And you, you get to the middle, the heart of that onion. By the time you peel all that off, whew, that aroma is everywhere, isn't it? I, mean, I don't know if aroma is really the best term for it. But, okay. but isn't that right? Now, it, while it was sitting there, nothing happened. You didn't even smell it, generally. But as you peel it, as you get closer to that heart of that onion, the more of the aroma of that onion is released. Now, is the aroma of the onion increasing? No. It was just encapsulated. And the more you peel it, the more you can smell it. Why? Because it's not being hidden anymore. Right? It's just being released. It's getting closer to the surface. What people call increase of anointing is not an increase of anointing. It is just getting closer to the surface because you are dying and peeling away your layers. That's all it is. It's not a matter of the increase. Because see, here's what you have to remember. Anytime you say, well, uh, we need revival. We're praying for God to send revival then what you're actually saying is God hasn't sent it, and the reason we're not revived is because God hasn't sent it. So the reason we're not revived is God's fault. Is that right? So basically what you're doing is you're blaming God for your lack of revival. Now, I would challenge you. How many of you have a, a concordance at home? You got a concordance? Good, okay. Go home, look up the word revival. And look up the word, first off, you won't find it, but number two, <clears throat> you'll only find the word revive a, a time or two. But look up the word Revive and revival in the New Testament. You won't find it, especially the way we talk about it. You know what it says? That revival is an Old Testament concept. To be revived, you have to be dead. Right? Nobody in the church of Jesus Christ is dead. You were dead. You were made alive. You understand? Now, if you're, if you're dead again, then guess what? Then you're outside of Christ. You're not born again. Simple as that. Now, what we do see in the Bible, though, in the New Testament, is not about revival. What the, what the New Testament says is, awake to righteousness. He doesn't say, God, wake us. He says, you awake to righteousness. You understand? So this idea about revival among, I mean, first off, Christians don't need revival. Right? The dead need revival. That's called, we call it evangelism. That's what it should be. Right? But what we need to do is awake to righteousness, find out who we are in Christ. And when you do that, you can't help but be on fire. Now, you find out who you are in Christ. You find out what he's done for you. You find out that your past is not being held against you anymore. Amen. You awake to righteousness. You start to get stirred up. See what you cause. And that's what's so strange. Again, we're going to move into it right now, as a matter of fact. I keep saying that. We're getting there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but we talk about being hungry. Oh, God, I hunger. I thirst. Oh, God, I hunger and thirst after you. That is not biblical. It, as a matter of fact, it is denying the power of Christ. Do you understand? It's, it's not even, well, yeah, but you know what? The, no, it's not, I know what they mean. It is wrong. Do you understand? Right? I'll, I'll, it's, it's right here in your manual. Okay, we're going to get there in just a second. Because the reason I want to tell you that is because you have to realize that what you say is hunger and thirst. See, you, you, you think that it's spiritual to hunger and thirst, and it's not. It's denying you even being born again. Every time you say, I hunger and I thirst, you're saying, I'm not born again. That's what you're saying. Do you understand that? I, again, I'll prove it. I know you're looking at me strange. Like, okay, but I'll prove it. Now, the reason I'm saying that is because here's the thing. You think you should hunger and thirst, and you shouldn't. The problem is that what you really have, and, and this is the problem because you, you got something, you don't know what you got. What you actually have is zeal. See, what you think is hunger and thirst is actually zeal. But you've been taught to hunger and thirst, so you take this zeal for God and you turn it to asking for something. 
Paul said, you have a zeal without knowledge. Well, that's pretty much where, where the church is. We have a zeal for God, but we keep t being told, well, we got a hunger and thirst. So we turn our zeal toward hunger, we turn it toward God, when we ought to turn our zeal for God onto the world. And when you turn your zeal toward the world, now what I mean is, you have a zeal for God, but you turn it toward the world, then you start winning the lost, you start healing the sick, and you start reaching out. But as long as you say, I hunger and thirst, you're looking at you, which is selfish, and you're looking at God and saying, fill me, fill me. And God's saying, go to the world, go to the world. And we end up getting wrapped up in this thing, and, it, and the, the entire bit of Christianity ends up being selfish, which is the exact opposite of Christianity. The beginning of Christianity is when you cease being selfish. And as long as you're selfish, you have not started in Christianity yet. You understand? And yet the church teaches us to be selfish and say, oh, I got a hunger, I got a thirst, I got to pull this thing down, I got to get a hold of it. No, you don't need to do it. What you have, that's what Peter said, such as I have, I give to you. That was zeal. He wasn't hungering. You understand? He had a zeal that he turned onto the world. That's the problem. We don't need a revival movement. We need to awake to righteousness, realize what we have, and that we have this treasure in earthen vessels, and take it to the world, and talk like Jesus, act like Jesus, because he wants to live through you. And you say, but, but I'm not like that. There you go again. Get your mind off you. I'm not ready. I'm not prepared. I'm, get your mind off you. You go out there and act like Jesus. Act like what he said in this word is true. And when you do, you don't think about it. Well, I don't know if I have enough faith. Don't think about you. Go out there and bring life to the people. Amen? That's what this whole thing's about. Now, watch this. We're going to have to move fairly quick. I can do it in the next five minutes. Okay. Okay. Now, so now we see the difference here on the first page. Talks about Hebrews 1, 1, 1, 2. Okay, that's pretty self-explanatory. But where I want to take you is over, now I hope you read this manual. I mean, there's a lot in here. I hope you actually take it and read it, all right? But you have to realize there is a new covenant. In Hebrews 8, 6, it says, but now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant. Do you realize we have a better covenant, right? <clears throat> Established upon better promises. You know what that means? That means you don't have to go back to the Old Testament to find a good promise. The covenant you're in has better promises. Amen? Amen? Now, Watch this. Go to page, I think it's page 9. It should be page 9 in yours too. It starts at the top with um, the Old Testament. No. Yeah, the Corinthian church. There you go. <clears throat> at the top of page 9, it says the Corinthian church. The Corinthian church was not a perfect church. As a matter of fact, it was one of the most messed up churches in the Bible. There was sin in the Corinthian church that Paul said wasn't even heard of among the heathen. Right? And when the church is sinning better than the heathen, there is a problem. <laughs> okay? <laughs> With that in mind, remember that Paul also wrote that the Corinthian Christians came behind no one when it came to the gifts and operating in the gifts of the Spirit. Right? Now, what that proves is there can be sin in the church and the gifts will still operate. Right? That means there can be unbelief in the church and the gifts will still operate. That means there can be problems in the church and the gifts will still operate. Well, they didn't get healed because there's too much unbelief in the church. That is a lie. Amen. Right? Jesus healed in the marketplace where there was unbelief everywhere. Right. right? So quit using the excuse and tr quit trying to make God sound weaker than the devil. Right. God is stronger than the devil. Yeah. And belief will always override unbelief. Yeah. Amen? And your unbelief doesn't stop my belief. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. All right. Now, <clears throat> 1 Corinthians chapter 2, starting in verse 1. It's that Paul is writing to the Corinthian church, and he says, And I, brethren, so we know they're brethren, right? Now, <clears throat> he says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, I came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except or save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Now, for Paul to say it's something because he was a pretty smart fellow, right? He'd been through quite a bit. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and the power. Right? Now, any, now verse 5 starts out by saying that. Anytime you see a sentence start, really anytime, but especially when you see it start with the word that, you can add the word so in the beginning of it, before that. So actually what it says is, so that, 
In other words, he didn't come preaching the enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and power, so that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. You hear that? Our faith should not stand in wisdom in men's talk. It should stand in the demonstration of the Spirit and of power of God. Right? Christianity should be supernatural from start to finish. Amen? Okay. Now, how be it? We speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world. In other words, the wisdom we talk about is not the world's wisdom, nor of the princes of this world that come to nothing. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Even the hidden wisdom, that's the mystery, the hidden, hidden wisdom of God, which, now watch this, this hidden wisdom of God was ordained by God before the world unto our glory. You hear that? Oh, don't touch God's glory. Don't have to. He gave us his. Right? We got our own glory, and the glory we have is the, the glory of the fact that God hid some wisdom, and this was founded before the foundation of the world, and now it is being revealed to us. So we have some glory revealed to us. You know that statement says that we go from glory to glory? Right? And people kind of, when you hear that, you think, and we're going from glory to glory to glory, and it's awesome, we're going up. Okay, that's not true. Right? When it says we're going from glory to glory, you have to read that because it's over in Hebrews specifically, and it says that the glory of the first covenant was amazing, but the glory of the second covenant was even more amazing, and if the glory of the first covenant passed away and the glory of the sef- second covenant doesn't pass away, then that makes the glory of the second covenant greater. You're not moving from glory to glory to glory like levels. You're moving from the glory of the old covenant into it that passed away to a glory of the new covenant that never passes away and it abides forever. Right? So it's not degrees of glory. It is this glory to this glory. Do you understand that? From the old covenant to the new covenant. You got to move from one to the other. They are not the same and they won't work the same. How many of you have a computer? Okay, how many of you have Windows 3.1 on it? (laughs) Why not? It's what? Obsolete. Isn't it right? Why? Why? And matter of fact, if you try to put Windows 3.1 now on a computer, it won't even, there there are applications that won't open everything else. Why? Because it won't work right. Why? Because it's not the right operating system for the machine. The old covenant is not the right operating system for the machine of the new creation. They could not operate under that. You try to plug in the old covenant into a new creation, it won't work right. You won't get the results that Jesus had. You have to use a new operating system, and the new operating system is the new covenant, which is a covenant of grace. It's not a covenant of works. It's not a covenant of law. It's a covenant of love. It is a covenant of power. It's not a covenant of do's and don'ts. Amen? You've got to move from one covenant to the other. You cannot blend them together. That's why people get so messed up as they're trying to combine the old covenant and the new and make it work together. The old system is gone. It's obsolete. It waxed old, Hebrews said. The word wax old in Hebrews is a Greek word. It means to become obsolete. Quit trying to use it. Amen? When you try to use an obsolete system, you know what happens? You spend all your time trying to find parts to fix it. Is that right? All you do, you're con- if you try to use an old, like some old, old antique cars, you spend most of your time trying to find the parts. Right? What do you think Christianity is doing? We've got to find the parts that are missing to fix what's going on. Why? Because you're trying to use an obsolete system. Go into the new covenant. Operate in the new covenant. Nothing's missing. Everything's there. It's brand new. Everything works. Amen? All right. <coughs> he says, I want to move on to this before we take a break here. Yeah, we're doing pretty good. Okay. He says, uh, verse 8, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Now, later on, if you do the SWAT training, you'll see that what he says here is that the princes of this world didn't know what they were doing when they killed Jesus, because if they had, they wouldn't have done it. Okay, that's called an ambush. Jesus ambushed the enemy. He, He drew them in. He made them think he was weak. He allowed them to kill him, and they thought they were getting an advantage, and in actuality, it was a trap that he set because he knew that once he was killed, wrongly speaking, in a, in a manner of speaking, then he would gain power over them. So it was an ambush, right? Now, again, if you go back to the old Star Wars movie, 
I'll give you an example of it. Remember whenever uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi fought Darth Vader? Remember what he did? He was, remember he was buying time while they got on the Millennium Falcon? Remember that? They were all running out there. And they look back, and he's over there fighting, and he's doing a pretty good job fighting Darth Vader. And then at one point, he sees him safely in there. And what does he do? He raises the sword up, and Darth Vader sees this as his chance for a horizontal strike, so he comes across the strike. And he says, and if you strike me, Obi-Wan Kenobi says, and if you strike me down, I'll become more powerful than you can possibly imagine. That in itself encapsulates Christianity. It's amazing. I'm not saying Star Wars is a, is a, <laughs> is a theological textbook, all right? <clears throat> but it is amazing because we have to realize when we get struck down, when we are willing to lay down our life, we become more powerful than anyone can possibly imagine. I dare say there's no one in this room that truly fathoms what God has done in you by Jesus Christ. You, you, and I'm not saying I do either totally. I'm, I'm learning, I'm growing into this, but I'll tell you this. We have no clue to what is available to us. I mean, it is so, it is, I don't care. You see men of God do great and amazing things. You see the prophets in the Old Testament, water, rivers parting and all that kind of stuff. And, and you have all these things going on. And I'm telling you, that is nothing compared to what the Spirit of God can do in a human being that is totally and completely dead to self and lives for God. I'm telling you, we ain't seen nothing yet. Amen? But it's sure getting time. You watch, it's time. Watch. He says, <clears throat> now, he says they wouldn't have known or they wouldn't have cru crucified the Lord of glory. Now watch. He says, but as it is written, so this is an Old Testament quote, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. Now, you know that you've heard this quoted before. It was, oh, I hadn't seen an ear, hadn't heard. You know? And, and it's always, they're always looking off in the distance somewhere, and they always sound spiritual like they know something you don't know. Right? And they're always, oh, and, you know, half the time, I mean, you can tell it's religion when they start talking about it because they have a certain sound, you know, how, how it kind of fades off at the end. I hadn't seen. <laughs> you know, they get that look. And, and you can really tell when you get into it when they start the organ. Right? <laughs> Because in some reason, they, they want to start singing it, you know. I hadn't seen. Mm -hmm. And they, mm -hmm. you know, <clears throat> you know, nor ear heard, neither has it in the hearts of men. Uh, you get this rhythm. Neither has it entered the hearts of men, the things that God. <laughs> and see, that's just pure religion. <laughs> Amen. And, and you're sitting, and people sitting there, and they, about that time, they start whipping out the handkerchiefs. Mm -hmm. You know, and they just start getting all into it. Somebody will jump up and dance. You know, they stomp around in a circle. You know, and and all of a sudden, and they hadn't said anything. You know, and they're always looking off, and it's kind of like you want to go. What what's he seeing? You know, <clears throat> but he's just trying to sound spiritual, right? Now watch what he says though. I hadn't seen, ear hadn't heard, neither has entered the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those that love him, them that love him. Now, but God hath. Now, hath is past tense, right? But God hath revealed them. Revealed them what? The things that I hadn't seen or hadn't heard. The things that man, that man has not, that doesn't know what the things that God has prepared for those that love him. Those things have been revealed to us. Watch this. <clears throat> but God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. Not by your eyesight, by his spirit. He didn't reveal it here, he reveals it here. And he says, for the spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him. Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. In other words, anything you've learned about God, you've learned by the spirit of God. You weren't smart enough to figure it out, right? Because your, your brain, now listen, your carnal mind cannot figure out the things of God. It can't figure it out. It can't even contain the things of God. That's why God had to recreate us and have us made so that we could contain the things of God. And then he tells us because of that, we can have our mind renewed. And once you get your mind renewed, now the Spirit of God can flood up into your mind. And then you have what's called the mind of Christ. But the carnal mind can't get it. See, that's why carnal people, until you're born again, you can't even renew your mind. 
right? You have to get born again first and then have the mind renewed. Why? Because you can't understand anything about the Spirit without having the Spirit. Because it's the Spirit that reveals everything to us. Amen? Now, he says, verse 12, Now we have received, not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God. Why? No, there's that word, that. Anytime you see the word that, ask why, right? You always ask why when you see the word that. So that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Why do you have the Spirit? So you can speak in tongues and dance and have good church services? No. So that you can know the things, now watch this, not just the things of God, the things that are freely given to us of God. Freely given, right? Not, not grudgingly, not God. I, I hate these books, they come out with them. You know, the God who hides himself. What? If God wanted to hide himself, all he had to do was not show up. <clears throat> right? I mean, come on. Well, God hides himself and you got to search him out. I know. That's an Old Testament scripture. That's true. Why? Because man couldn't do it. But it's amazing because now we have books and we think that now we're supposed to be, oh, God's hiding this and we got to search it out and that kind of stuff. God's not hiding anything. He, like, the most misunderstood book in the Bible, the book of the revelation of Jesus Christ. Oh, you can't read that book. You can't understand that book. Every, that's, a, that's a secret, mysterious book. It's a hidden book. It's not the hidden of Jesus Christ. It's the revealing of Jesus Christ. And yet the devil keeps everybody so scared of it. Well, you can't read that because you can't understand it. Just read it and believe it. Real simple. It's amazing. Well, well it's the revelation. Okay, it's called the revelation, not the hiding. <clears throat> He's not, it, the book of Revelation isn't trying to hide Jesus. It's trying to reveal him. But everybody wants to say, well, we can't understand this and can't understand that. Well, if you go into that viewpoint, you won't understand it. But if you go into the viewpoint, well, I have the Spirit of God. And I can understand all the things that have been given to us freely of God. So I can go in there and I can read it and the Spirit of God will teach me. Amen? All right. Yeah, I, don't, I don't think you're convinced yet, but we'll see. <clears throat> okay. He says, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teaches but which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Do you get that? That's why your relatives, your lost relatives, don't understand tongues. They don't understand healing. Why? They can't get it. Quit trying to explain it to them. Demonstrate it. When you demonstrate it, they'll want it. When they receive it, then they can understand it. Right? But you keep trying to explain it to them. Hardest people to get converted are people that are too analytical and too linear thinking because they want it all explained before they jump in. You can't do that. You got to jump in first. Then he gets it explained to you. It's kind of like saying, God, tell me your will and I'll tell you if I'll do it. And he says, no, you submit to my will and then I'll tell you what it is. That's what it is. Now, I will tell you this. His will is good, right? It's not bad, but everybody's afraid to give him control. <clears throat> now, he says, uh, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them for they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual, now listen, he that is spiritual judges all things. Oh, you're not supposed to judge. Hmm, that's not what this says. Depends on what you mean by judge. The Bible says, don't you know you're going to judge angels? He said, if you're going to judge angels, surely you could judge the menial things in the church, right? Now, what he's talking about not judging is pointing a finger at somebody and saying, you're going to hell. Why? Because you have just pronounced judgment on them as if there's no hope. And many times when you do that, people give up hope. As long as there's breath, there's hope. So you don't judge that. And you can judge their fruits and go, I'm trying to tell you, if you keep doing that, you're going to end up in hell. You're headed that direction. What you're doing is not right. So you can do that. You can judge their fruit. You just don't judge their heart, right? And you can turn them around that way. You know, okay, <clears throat> different seminar. Okay. Now, he says, now watch this last part, verse 16. For who hath known the mind of the Lord? This is an Old Testament scripture. That he may instruct him. Oh, look at that word, but. What does that mean? That means that used to be true, but it's not now, right? But we have the mind of Christ. So people say, well, who knows what God's going to do? God's ways are mysterious. No, not if you know him. I mean, his ways are only mysterious to those that don't know him. Well, you know, his ways are above our ways. Well, you already get saved. <laughs> if, you're, if his ways aren't your ways, you're not saved, right? I mean, think about it. Well, you know, but, but he's out there and we, don't, we never know what he's going to do next. And Yeah, you do. He's going to do this. 
He said, God is the most predictable individual in the universe. You know? And you know why he can be predictable? Because nobody can stop him. Amen? I used to, when I trained one time, I went up to uh, Memphis, Tennessee. I trained under Bill Wallace. He was a um, world middleweight karate, uh, full contact karate champion. He had the fastest kick in the world. His left leg could kick 70 miles an hour. Literally, all right? I mean, everybody, they interviewed him one time and said, because he had a, a judo accident where, or incident where he damaged his right knee so he couldn't kick with that leg, but so he could kick with his left leg. And they called him Superfoot, you know, <laughs> needless to say, Superfoot. And so, but he would knock everybody out with his left leg. And they went and interviewed him and said, you know, you can only kick with your left leg. He said, that's right. He said, well, don't you think that's a little limiting because, you know, you got this... You know, everybody knows you're going to kick with that left leg. He said, oh, yeah, they know I'm going to use it. There's just nothing they can do about it. <laughs> right? That's the way God is. It's like, I don't mind telling you what I'm going to do. Right? See, the only, you know when God quit hiding secrets? When Jesus was crucified. Up until then, he had to keep it secret so, that he, so he could spring the trap. Once the trap was sprung, poof, everything's wide open. Now, matter of fact, that our key is to go around and tell everybody everything. Our job is to go around and tell everybody all, this, all those secrets, ah, it's all done now. It's all in the open. We won. That's it. Isn't that amazing? There's no secrets. There's no this deep thing. Watch, I'll, I'll prove to you. I've got to send you to lunch. I mean, not lunch, but break. Okay. <clears throat> I, got, I got meat you don't know about, so it's okay. So, anyway. <laughs> okay. Now watch. He says, he goes on in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal. Stop right there. Now, what does that tell you? Paul could not talk to the Corinthians like they were spiritual people, but like they were carnal, correct? Okay, even as unto babes in Christ. So now Paul says that being carnal is being a babe in Christ, or being a babe in Christ is carnal, right? So as long as you're a baby in Christ, you're carnally minded. It means you still are sense-ruled, sense-oriented, that kind of thing, right? Now, and that means that you're not spiritual. So there is a difference between, between being carnal and spiritual. Now, if you're going to be carnal, a babe in Christ, or spiritual, now if you're spiritual, if carnal is a babe in Christ, what is spiritual? Mature, grown up, right? So you've got babes in Christ and you've got mature. You've got carnal, you've got spiritual, right? Okay, let's move on. He says, now I'm going to get you to thinking about this here because I've I got to get you nailed down on this where you can't slip out, you know, slip away from it, okay? So, I have fed you with milk and not with meat. Okay, for hitherto, that means up till now, you were not able to bear it. Bear what? Meat, right? So in other words, he said, I'm giving, I've given you milk, not meat, because up till now, you couldn't take meat. Is that what it says? Okay, next part. Neither yet now are you able. So what is that saying? He still cannot give you meat, right? So he can only give you milk, right? So he's talking, so the, now notice, this is in chapter 3. He's got all these other chapters he's going to be talking that he's writing. He writes in the very beginning, he says, you guys are carnal, you're not spiritual, I can't give you meat, I can only give you milk. Is that right? That means that there is no meat in the book of Corinthians. Right? He said, I can't give, he said, even now I can't give it to you. You're still carnal. So if he said, I can't give it to you, it means he didn't put it there. Now if he didn't put it there, you can't dig it out. That means you can't dig meat out of the book of Corinthians. Oh, we're getting in the meat now. This is, we're, well, we're, st we're going into Corinthians. We're taking apart the Greek, and we're, going, and we're getting the meat. No, there's no meat there. Paul said, I didn't put it there. You can't pull out what he didn't put in. Is this right? Yes. right? I know it's not fun, but it's true, okay? Because <clears throat> I know you want to be deep, and you want to, ooh, and it's, uh, no. <clears throat> no, you don't need to be deep, deep, right? Just be, be simple. Be direct, right, amen? Now, he says, for you are yet carnal. In other words, you're still carnal. Now, he's writing a letter. Now, do you realize when he finished the letter, they were still carnal? Right? They didn't progress as he wrote. He wrote it, and then they had to read it and then grow after they read it. But everything in the, in the book of Corinthians is carnal. It's all to carnal people, to spiritual babes, and it's not meat. It's only milk. Right? Okay, just trying to not nail it down there. For whereas, and he says, you are, you are still carnal, which means he still couldn't give you meat. Right? Okay. For you are yet carnal, for whereas is among you envying, strife, and divisions, are you not carnal and walk as men? In other words, you act like everybody else. Well, how are we supposed to act? Like sons of God. Not being carnal. Okay? 
He says, for while one says, I'm of Paul, another I'm of Apollos, are you not carnal? Now he's, he's detailing how carnal they are. Who then is Paul and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom you believed, even as the Lord gave to every man? Now, he says all that. He just told him, I can't give you meat. I can only give you milk. You're carnal. You're not spiritual. You're babies in Christ. Is that true? Now, <clears throat> this is in chapter 3. Nine chapters later, which makes it what? 1 Corinthians chapter 12. What does he talk about? Spiritual gifts. He says, I can't give you meat. I can only give you milk. He says, you're carnal. You're not spiritual. And yet... He details spiritual gifts, tells them how to operate them, how to do it right, how not to do it wrong, and he tells them, here's about the spiritual gifts. Is that right? Which means that gifts, number one, are, were and can be operated by carnal Christians, not spiritual Christians. Number two, it also proves that because he said that, that the gifts are not meat. Because he said, I can't give you meat. And yet he details the gifts. So the gifts are not meat. The gifts are milk, according to what he said. Is this true? All right, I know I have to nail it down step by step, right?